Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vicente Orozco Sevilla. I'm one of the cardiothoracic surgeons here at Baylor College of Medicine at Texas Heart Institute. And of course, it's an honor for me to be able to share some of the knowledge about in the updates in, in aortic surgery for the Texas Heart Institute Perfusion Conference. Uh, also, uh, I want to show my gratitude to all the perfusionists and perfusion students because you guys made all work or work very easy in the OR. So this is our, my disclosures. And we're gonna start very briefly with, uh, we're gonna piece by piece the aortic root, the aortic arch and the thoracic abdominal. As a surgeons, as you know, we are very reluctant to change, but uh, I'm gonna go briefly over some of the advances that happened in the last uh, a few years and, and some of the things that we incorporate in the current practice. So first, we have to understand, uh, talking about the root, what is aortic root components? And the aortic root is pretty much a unit that has a sinotubular junction. They have the sinusoidal salva. We have the annulus, the subaortic segments, and aortic leaflets. This is all the components that they go when we talk about the aortic root. We have to see the aortic root in the way we see it as a crown and three rings. The blue line or the top ring is what we call the sinotubular um, junction and is the junction of the interleaflet triangulus to the aorta. We have the anatomic ventricular aortic junction, which is the, the yellow one. And is uh, every time that you look at that through all sewing up and, and, and a valve is what we use or is the anatomic the boundary that we use to sew or, or surgical valves. And we have the number three, which is the green, which is the virtual basal ring, and is the annulus that echocardiographers are using and the CT scans, and, and is more relevant in the tablet world. So with this, or understanding of the aortic root, it's, 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 it's more uh, update uh, putting these three rings together. So that's what we see as surgeons, and, and sometimes we share with you as a perfusionist how we're going to conduct these operations. Also, another important uh, topic that it comes um, important is the anatomy of the aortic leaflets or on the, or, or understanding of this is, is very important uh, because uh, recently for the, the work of different uh, surgeons in Europe mainly that they studied this, uh, we come with some measurements and we always talk about in the war about the effective height and the geometric height. And this is always going to tell us the quality of the leaflets because the more and more we know about um, how the repair will impact the survival of a patient, we know that repairing this valve, it will be better than replace it. So we always ask him about uh, or working with the with the with the anesthesiologist and ask him about the effective height, the geometric height, and also some uh, there are so, some some values that we can uh, obtain in the OR just to have an idea. Effective height it has to be between nine and ten millimeters, and the geometric height, which is the the amount of leaflet that we have to repair, it has to be about. 20 millimeter. Also, uh, it's important to identify if we have any uh, problems with the cause, with the cause for traction, calcification, or perforation. It will allow us to decide what valves then they can be repaired or what valves we need to be replacing it. Another important job that that, that come from Europe in 2021 is is about the geometry of the valves that we're going to repair. This is more important for the type of a cuspid aortic valve repair that that we're doing. And right now we need to ask, uh, besides all the all the previous um, qualities of the valve that I, that I, that I mentioned about the, the numbers and millimeters, we also have to take in consideration about the symmetry of these valves. The bicuspid valve is is, 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 is is more in vogue right now between surgeons because we're trying to repair these valves that previously we just replaced it with tissue valves or mechanical valves. And the more we understand about the symmetry, the chances that the patient will end up with a valve uh, um, sparing operation, they're better. So we know that all these uh, bicuspid valves with, with, the, with the valves that are symmetric of 100 and 180 degrees or very or somasymmetric valves, we can repair. Uh, 
very asymmetric valves. There are some groups that they're 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 doing more of these repairs, but the results are not there. And 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 it will be important to see in, in the years to come if this repair of very asymmetric valves um there there it, it will impact in, in in the survival of these patients. The only thing that we know is that repairing these very asymmetric valves um it's, it's it's a challenge and a difficult situation for any surgeon who who tries to do this. So in in our experience, we're trying to uh, repair the symmetric and the asymmetrics and the very asymmetric valves. We we still kind of hesitate to to go and 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 do a repair in these type of valves. Another important topic that that comes more often that it was neglected in the past is the importance of uh, what we call the patient prosthesis mismatch usually related to the small aortic annulus. But what is a, a small aortic annulus? It's, the, it's defined by an annulus that would not accommodate a prosthesis size of more than 21 millimeters. So any patients that uh, come with a, we ended up putting about 19 or less than 21, almost we can assure that this, 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 this patients are gonna end up with some sort of patient prosthetic, prosthesis mismatch. Another thing that we learned and, and we know from the past, but we know more is that the labeling of the surgical valve is not uniform across the border of all the vendors and reinforce our uh, understanding and, and our curiosity to always check what valve we're gonna use and what it would be if it would match the effective orifice area of these patients as for the people who, uh, uh, for the perfusionists who they're being in the OR with uh, with me or Dr. Cuselli, we always asking about, you know, what is the, what is the, the, the bowel match to the BSA of the patient? So before we start a case, we always ask you, what is the BSA of the patient? It's not a random question. It's a question that we always use because it's gonna allow us either way, one, to, calculate how much we got to flow on the pump. And also it will allow us to decide if we're going to replace the valve, what type of valve, what brand of valve we're going to use. So as an example, if you have uh, the classic Magnaese valve, you can have a patient that with the BSA is uh, two, you can see that the minimum to be in the green light and not to have a, 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 a patient prosthesis mismatch, it should be at least a 23 valve. So if you ended up putting a 21 or 19, for sure, you're going to have a patient prosthesis mismatch. And it entails that pretty much a patient will have a severe aortic stenosis with uh, a low capacity to exercise. Um, it will decrease his life expectancies by a lot just by not putting the right the right size of valve. And also not all the valves they, create, they, they, they were created equally. So as you can see, uh, this is an, 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 an all diagram but we have all these uh, normograms in the OR ready to go so we can tell us exactly if it's an, a good valve or a good effective orifice area for, for, for our patient. So this is the definition. Uh, is severe is less than 0 0.65 centimeters meter square but also uh, 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 we are concerned when it's less than as we mentioned 0 0.85 because it qualifies some other rate but severe uh, is what we are trying to avoid. And the reason is because in these meta-analysis, as you can see, having a, a patient prosthesis mismatch affects the long-term survival and increases the cardiac mortality by two-fold or six-fold just by having patient prosthesis mismatch. So it's important not to leave this patient with this. Uh, or understanding also uh, how we can prevent it. Well, so all our patients no, it's not like you just get a TE. All the patients almost get a CTA with the tablet protocol. It's, just, it's almost that we order standard in all our patients because we allow us to see the size of the annulus and we know in advance that we how we how what we have to do with this patient. It's an easy decision. If we have a patient with a high surgical risk uh, patient, so a tablet is a good option because uh, uh, it, it's a true that a tablet has a better hemodynamics than any surgical valve we can put it in. But uh, if we have a, a, a low risk patient, intermediate risk patient uh, with 
you know, and, and, and those patients that we can put up good size valve well, so we just have 23, so 23 will be, but what happened with those patients that have a 19 or 21 and it's a good surgical candidate? So we always try to give them the, 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 the biggest valve that we can do. So we have to plan according to this, either way with a root enlargement or use one of the rapid deployment valves or use a, a root replacement or, 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 or a suture spray prosthesis. So we always have to have a plan in advance before we, we commit ourselves to a valve replacement. This is our different types of aortic root enlargements that we have. It's just divided in anterior and posterior. Some of them, they are more complicated than the others, but uh, the ones that we fabricate in the group is a NIX procedure. It's an incision across the non-coronary sinus. And uh, there are other ones that, uh, like the Ross Cono, is anterior, the Nunez and the Magunian. And recently, as an update, uh, and for the last two years, there is, there is uh, the group of Michigan popularized the, what they call the Y incision, which is... Uh, uh, a rectangular patch, which apparently can increase the size of uh, the valves that we put by two, three. So you have to 23, you can end up putting a 27 millimeter valve using using this technique. But uh, as we mentioned, or 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 we you know we try to to give what the patient needs, and I don't know if any patient needs a, a 29 or 27 valve, but that would depends of uh, according to uh, to the BSA of the patient, but. Um, a NICS procedure is what uh, we favor. So we put up our, our, our classic uh, patch. We enlarge a valve by, by another size, a 21. You should give a 23. And that would probably be, some, be good enough for, for even for a, a tablet platform in some or patients with uh, decent BMI. The complexity of the aortic root replacement is it could be from just the classic ventil or xenograft with a stentless valve, a tissue valve, is um, the homograph, which all these uh, 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 kind of like prosthetic material stuff for the homograph, which is a cadaveric. But uh, if you move the complexity of the homograph, I think uh, when you when when you when you move the needle to a valve spinal root at Ross operation, so I think I uh, require more um, training and more technical skills to be able to perform this type of operations, especially the Ross operation, which is uh, uh, is pretty much taking the the pulmonary valve and putting it in an aortic position, replacing the pulmonary artery uh, and valve with uh, uh, some sort of uh, a scenograph or, or, or homograph, and uh, those operations, there have been more recent popularized in, 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 in other centers across the United States with uh, good results. But, uh, you know, uh, it's an operation that's been um, um, in uh, use in the past. And right now with the new techniques and, and new ways to stabilize uh, the, 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 the new route, uh, I think uh, it, it's getting more 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 uh, more in the armamentarium of, of, of surgeons. But whatever we can, we try always to preserve the valve and, and, and we use the valve sparing, what we call the David operation or David 5 operation, which is a reimplantation of the valve. And as, as you can see here, it's just pretty much dissecting the whole aortic root, the, all, all the components that we talk about in the first slide, and, and, and suspend this valve in, 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 in a graft that we call, and it could be a stray graft or we call the valsalva graft. And once we dissect the root, we we'll replant the valves and suture it, replant the coronaries. I have a quick video here that I'm going to show you. And, uh, and it starts with uh, dissection of the non coronary sinus, leaving uh, some remnant of tissue, dissecting the coronaries out, the left and right coronary. And um, this dissection has to be deep down in the root. We put uh, uh, some stitches to stabilize uh, the annulus, and then the graph is uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, size and, and upgrade uh, to, to five millimeters more about the size of the annulus. And then the valve is, is, is sewn, is resuspended inside the graft. And as you can see, the valve is uh, competent and it's perfect. And then we saw, we continue with the rest of the operation, replacing or ascending graft and re-implanting um, the coronaries. So more new, just for uh, update, uh, I, it, we are not very far to, or oh, is here already, the end of Intel, the University of Maryland performed the first, uh, uh, it was done first in Brazil, but uh, the, the first series of cases was on the University of Maryland, and uh, pretty much is uh, an endo case. 
requires a lot of planeation is uh, uh, is using pretty much what we have is a a, 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 a graph uh, that we'll use for a tiver and uh, a tiver inside that graph and it's usually you know and, and then you 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 create the fenestrations uh, with uh, precise measurements under CTA. And uh, once uh, you measure this, you just pretty much do this endovascular. So there is four patients, apparently the patients that were uh, high risk patients. And, and so far the results are being, they're being encouraging. So obviously we need more data to be able to popularize this technique, but uh, it's something that is coming and is being done here in the United States. So uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, discard the option that we'll be performing some of these things very soon and in, 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 in Baylor for patients that otherwise they don't have any other option but being in the vascular repair. So what about the aortic arch? Well, in order to, to, to do a hemi-arch, total arch, or go beyond the arch with a total arch replacement, and either way, as a frozen elephant trunk or or, or, or uh, uh, extend to thoracic abdominal or, or completion of a, a, a stage two frozen elephant trunk. So we have to know our options during circular toilet rest. And the first and the most important thing is how we should protect the brain is uh, either way we still use in hypothermic circular toilet rest alone. We use the retrograde air perfusion or antigrade air perfusion. This is our options. And there is always something that we have to consider when we, when we do this type of cases. We have to know our temperature target range. This is a profound hyperthermia, deep hypothermia, moderate to mild. And, um, uh, I think uh, it's the consensus that we have, but uh, in before we, we we decided to go in 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 what type of temperature we 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 we're gonna we're gonna use for for uh, obviously it's, it's, it's a case uh, selection and we choose based on what type of operation we're gonna do. Obviously, if we're gonna do a, a proximal arch with a very short uh, short uh, circulatory rest, so probably moderate for my hypothermia is good, but. Uh, either for 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 total arch press moderate can be acceptable. There is some sort of uh, patients that we have to do deep, deep hypothermia, but there's there is more and more the, the rare occasions. But in order to to know what temperature we're gonna use, we have to go back to this one of my favorite slides that uh, we have to, we got to know why. And, and, and it's because of metabolic demands of the brain. We know that the brain uses 2% of the total body weight, 50% of the total cardiac output, 20% of the total body oxygen, and 25% of the total body glucose. It has no reserves to use aerobic glycolysis and ATP. And, um, and having lactate, uh, secondary to the glycolysis increases the lactate and increases the, 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 the brain damage just by having that. So knowing this, we have to know what are the temperature? What are the limits of a safe circulatory rest? So every time that we go on this type of cases for for and this is important for for the, the perfusion students to now to know to get to read this study is 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 a landmark study is by McCulloch was presented in the aortic symposium in 1999 and it tells us that the metabolic demands of the brain they are not zero even when you are at 10 degrees you still are using consuming oxygen and around 11 percent 11 percent of this so and also it's correlated to how many minutes we have to solve this anastomosis so uh, if you're doing a total arch on the circulatory race and you you pretty much have to cool down to 15 degrees to have a 30 min 30 minutes uh, uh safe side to not to have a, 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 a brain damage in these patients so that's the reason that we use either way other uh, adjunctives like um, antigressor perfusion or retrogressor perfusion in this meta-analysis uh, uh, of uh, 68 studies we show that uh, everything is favored according to be used antigressor perfusion or retrogressor perfusion so if you go out in the community and your surgeon tells you what we should use i think uh, what well, you should tell him is he should use some sort of protection either way, antigressive perfusion or retrograde, but not deep hypothermic circulatory rest. I think uh, uh, the uh, stroke is, is is a little bit more common when you use uh, this type of uh, technique versus using ACP and RCP. So we have to know how to what kind of relationships we have, and pretty much 
any artery is good to provide the inflow from the femoral to the axillary to the nominate to the left carotid to direct aortic cannulation to the subclavian transapical and recently the transeptal and and some of the some of you guys saw uh, us doing uh, some uh, samurai cannulation in which uh, uh, I think there is a, a uh, talk about samurai, but it's just a direct. Um, uh, you transect the the the, the aorta and and cannulate directly in the the, the aorta, and, and it is useful in 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 patients with type A aortic dissections. So we go. Uh, somebody's going to talk about this. I'm going to go into details because there is some specific specifics about how to be conducted. But just to mention that uh, those are the the things that they're they are new and include the transeptal and the samurai cannulation. What about uh, what is better? Uh, I think uh, there is no difference. This is part of uh, uh, Dr. Provenza, Dr. Sally's uh, work in the past about uh, where if there's any difference between axillary and nominate cannulation. The, the reality is there is no difference between the two techniques, but there is. this is new and this is a uh, uh, a randomized trial comparing the axillary versus the nominate artery for cerebral protection in aortic surgery from the Can from the Canadian group. And what they did is very interesting. It's very hard to do a prospective randomized control trial, but they have a few patients, 56 for the axillary cannulation and 55 for the nominate. And what they found is very interesting. Even um, they, they, they did the case and they have a diffusion weight MRI and postoperatively. And what they found is like uh, all these patients they have severe rain lesions. There was probably a lot of this, uh, they, were, they were silent, that we call, but uh, as you can imagine, having uh, some sort of damage, even if it's radiologically, uh, is very important because we don't know if uh, over a long term period of time, this is gonna be impactful in, 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 in how these patients are gonna behave according to, to uh, memory loss or dementia or or some other sort of um, uh, ischemic or, or loss of uh, grade or white matter matter so uh, i think uh, uh, it's important to know that what we do is not just not because the patient wake up doesn't mean doesn't have any any lesions and there there are radiological evidence that there is some sort of uh, emboli by by mri so this is important to know what about the arch, the arch repair? This is uh, what we prefer to do in the OR. We always uh, pack the head in ice. We float the field with CO2. This is to avoid uh, some gas emboli. We maintain usually, as we mentioned, the moderate hypothermia for, for or, or, or arches. I think uh, the repair is faster. Uh, it's less time to cool or rewarm, less time on the pump because we, we avoid time to either cooling or rewarming. And I think uh, it reduces the risk of coagulopathy. Um, we always use bilateral ACP when we can, uh, adds a little bit more complexity having, uh, uh, two or sometimes three cannulas to perfuse, uh, even the subclavian, or sometimes you have to perfuse a vertebral. Uh, we don't know how many patients they, they, they have an incomplete circular willis because we don't have a cerebral angiography in most of these patients. So we assume that, uh, even we assume that all these patients they have an incomplete uh, a normal circle with it. So in that in that way, we always can add a second uh, a cannula. So we uh, provide the perfusion pressures, so usually around the 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury. The flow rates is just a standard for six to 10 millimeters kilogram per minute. And uh, we use the alpha stat uh, blood gas approach and this is our, our perfusate is, is very similar to what we use 20 to 28 maintaining the hematocrit of 25 30 we use the nears so, or, or oximetries during the during the during the the the, the, the case and this is uh, what uh, in general that uh, we we ask to or we we do for our cases uh it's a long time since the first uh, elephant trunk got uh, 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 down by uh, by Dr. Bors in Germany, and we come along from the modification by this Benson. And as you can see here, this is a small video of how uh, uh, the classic elephant trunk uh, used to do. We pretty much we um, invert the graph in order to in, in order to be able to to saw in the in in, in the distal arch, and usually it's the, uh, around ten centimeters, so we can provide this. Um, 
to allow us to come and do a second stage and complete or or uh, either way or endovascular repair or or open approach. And the things are changed from this to this, to the hybrid frozen elephant trunk, which uh, Dr. Cusseli was the national or a principal investigator for, for, for Baylor with the Torflex device. And the Torflex device is the, the, the uh, recent in Europe has been done, but the United States at the last, um, I think a year and a half ago was approved by the FDA. So we are we are using this technique for for you guys who are in, in the OR with us, we're using more and more Toraflex. Uh, Toraflex is an hybrid prosthesis, is, is, it includes a, a, the, the a stain graft sewing into a dacron graft, and it's already crimped and, and ready to, to be deployed. And it's a versatile device because uh, allows us to either we complete um, the second stage, either endovascular, or we allow us also to do a, a open open completion as a, as a, either way, any 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 um, extent one or two that we need to do in this type of patients. So uh, this is uh, what we did, facilitates the, 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 the repair into the distal aorta. And um, it's a, a very nice uh, device and uh, with good results and we're using more and more for almost any uh, type of arch pathology. So this is a video of uh, how the device is, is used for, for those who they are in the, they're being in the OR with us. This is what we do, we transect the arch. At this point, uh, we are perfusing with our cannulas, doing anti-aggressive perfusion with, to the carotid and, 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 and um, via the nominate artery, and we advance a wire, and we advance we advance or 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 our tibar portion of the of the graft. We unsheet the device, Let's release it, take the wire out, and they have a collar that this is going to be sewn into the arch distal arch is the completion. So it's uh, in this case we illustrate that we we came we came back and we extend to repair with a couple of pieces of a T-bar, which uh, many of you have participated in, in our hybrid room doing this uh, operation. And it's, it's an it's a nice platform to 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 do this. Another uh, thing that is coming is the endo arch is here. Uh, the endo arch has been done uh, already in, in in a couple centers, and and it's gonna be more of uh, of the use and in, in different different uh, the gore cook. They're they all coming, but there are still some technicalities and associated with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the device that precludes to use it. The the the, the stroke rate is, is is still high for for this uh, technology but you know the technology is improving every day so we will be able to to offer this um here very soon what about the torque abdominal aorta uh, i cannot emphasize that it takes a team and and you as a perfusionist there they're in the core and, and, and they're very important i'm very happy to work with you because you you get you you perfusion is 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 is, is so important that we cannot do the case without you so but also I gotta give a prompt to the other part of the team, the anesthesia, the surgical nurses, the critical care specialists, the CBI nurses. These torque abdominal cases takes a team. They are very, very challenging cases to to done and done well. And here at Baylor, we have a great team, and 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 we we can continue to have good outcomes and good results with these um, very challenging operations. So the evolution of the open torque abdominal repair. So we went for the no use of heparin for the moderate heparinization for the clamp and saw technique for the use of leg hard bypass CFF drain use of visceral perfusion and cold renal perfusion to the selective use of branch grafts. So all uh, this is our interoperative strategies that we use. For moderate heparinization to permissive my hyperthermia, we reattach the mental arteries and we use the corrina perfusion whenever we can we can we can put this one and uh, and for extent one and two and select others we use always cerebral spinal fluid drainage, left heart bypass and perfusion of the SMA and celiac. So this is uh, as you many of us uh, of you guys saw us completing this uh, this. Uh, cases but what I, what I mentioned is uh uh or or 
is to mention that the, the left heart bypass, uh, we use the, the left atrium and we use either femoral or, or direct cannulation of the uh, the aorta to 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 go on or or or, or, or circuit. And historically, in many of the series of cases, we use the cold renal perfusion to protect our kidneys. This is our, our, our protocol using manitol and tilprednisolone. And uh, it's a complete repair. And recent in the updates, I don't know if uh, I want to give a credit to, to Dr. Shu, who is going to be joining our faculty next year. Uh, we started using what uh, probably you saw us in, in the past using the hyperoxygenated blood during the left heart bypass. And what it is, is, and we come across this, is that uh, the renal perfusion accounts for 20, 25% of the total cardiac output. And we use in, what we use in cabbages, the, the oxygen delivery. Uh, we thought that uh, the not delivering oxygen to the kidney has an impact in in in, in renal uh, dysfunction. So what we did is uh, we add an oxygenator. In the past, we didn't want to use an oxygenator because we um, you know we used to have high ACTs, and right now we can run a low ACT and connect an oxygenator to the left heart bypass and and maintain and and. The ACT is in the in the three fifties and 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 it's good to, and, and it won't clog the oxygenator. So we allow us to 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 deliver uh, extra oxygen to the kidneys instead to to just perfusing with cold renal. So I think uh, we also observed that with cold renal perfusion there was always a, a transient cessation of urinary output and with slow recovery renal function in, in the postoperative period. But with this technique using pretty much patient's own blood. Uh, loaded with oxygen, patients never stop uh, making urine. They always, uh, you know, we're busy. We're perfusing the kidney, the patient usually doesn't doesn't decrease his urinary output. So we are experimenting with the, this technique. Uh, we have a series of patients uh, that Anna presented in the AATS, and uh, there are not many, but there are more to come. And this is the technique that we're using, as you can see here, uh, is, is, is pretty much uh, using the, 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 the classic circuit of the left heart bypass connected to a centrifugal pump. And um, we have flow probes, which allow us independently measure the flow that goes to, 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 to the kidneys. And also uh, we can use the same uh, 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 a technique to perfuse the, the the celiac and SMA. I think uh, the more organs we perfuse, the better. But this technique was specifically designed for for the kidneys. But uh, more and more, when when we have in in, in Norway seeing the, the celiac and SMA, we can uh, always uh, put cannulas to try to deliver some extra oxygen. A uh, couple of things I think the, the extra oxygenation it can help in, in these patients that they are in a in a, in, 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 in in single lung ventilation, and especially in those patients with severe COPD, uh, having more oxygen uh, definitely it, it will help to about uh, to decrease the, the amount of shunting that these patients they they, they have doing this technique. Uh, there is more the thoracic abdominal the endothoric abdominal with uh, fenestrated and, and, and branch wraps. And we have off the shelf and patient specific graphs that the patient specific graphs, we tailor the graph to the anatomy of the patient, but it usually takes to six or seven weeks to sign a device like this versus having the off the shelf device that we can, we can do fenestrations in the back table and, uh, they are not, uh, I think the Achilles tendon of, 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 uh, of this, uh, Achilles heel of this uh, technique is uh, is the endolix that uh, off the shelf devices they can offer, but it's they're a good good uh, option for for patients when 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 they are not uh, surgical candidates. Bottom line: the repair of the thoracic abdominal and aortic arch are highly complex. Repair is constantly evolving. Even if we have small changes over the years, there is always something that we can do different about it. The cont contemporary outcomes are good, and uh, there is different ways to do things across the centers. And uh, with these uh, 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 slides, I want to uh, say thank you for your attention and thank you to again to the committee for your kind invitation. And it's always a pleasure to to talk uh, to our perfusion colleagues. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.